Hey, good morning, everyone. Let's see if I uh, probably all up late last night at the BOFs and other sessions, so I'll see if I can try to wake you up. <coughs> so this isn't going to be an in-depth research talk. You know, that's 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 for the people to submit the hard papers and everything like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the role I've had recently um, in some the swamp and other projects and trying to bring the things I've learned in my research to uh, to a larger sphere. I think much of what uh, I'm going to say is probably preaching to the choir. Many of you know and believe this stuff, so you know, let's nod your head. Um, and many of you could give parts of this talk um, maybe better, not with as many bad jokes, so we'll see how that goes. I hope I don't offend you with being too obvious. And, but what's obvious to many of you is not obvious to the large part of the IT and computer world out there, and that's a little frightening, and I want to talk about that. <coughs> and what I'd really appreciate is your, your insights, your feedback, your comments, um, either during or at the end of the talk, because uh, uh, if, if all I do is talk and don't get anything back from it, you know, it's, it's, it's not exciting for me. Um, <clears throat> the middle of the talk will be a little bit self-serving, because I'll talk about the Swamp Project, but I'll try to finish up with some cool, fun, bad code things that are going on out there, so maybe reward you with at the end. <clears throat> um, I, I just got back from uh, a week of backcountry, of off-the-grid backpacking, and um, up in the Sierras, which is my favorite place to hide away from the world, and I got in a surprising security discussion with one of the National Park, National Forest Rangers. Um, we we're talking about hanging my food bags, our food bags, to keep them away from critters, because when you're in the backcountry, there are people who want to eat your, eat your lunch um, and your dinner and your breakfast as well. <coughs> and they were complaining that my bag was hanging too low because I was not addressing the advanced persistent threat, which was the bears. And, and I was trying to explain to them how I wasn't concerned about the bears because they really weren't after me. There were better resources for them to go after than me. <laughs> uh, seriously, I was having this discussion. I'm not making this up. <coughs> and they said, well, you should get the best quality security, which are these bear barrels. Any backpackers in here? So you know about bear barrels. But bear barrels are really annoying because they're heavy. And carrying them around is a pain in the ass. Pain in the back, um, excuse me. Um, <coughs> and they require a tool to get open. And so you tend to leave them open because they're inconvenient to use. So then the chipmunks get in and eat your food. And so because you're careless about this heavyweight barrier, you end up being careless and leaving it there. And, and then the chipmunks eat your lunch. And so, and, and then, so we got in this big, long discussion, you know, well, you know, if I hang it up here, you know, the bears know, at Yosemite, you know, how to cut down your food. Well, I'm not at Yosemite. I'm in the wilderness. The bears are not as well trained there. And, and they said, well, but, you know, in the Grand Canyon, the birds will cut the rope, and then the, then the squirrels will eat your bag. And they work together. There's these teams. <laughs> <coughs> and so I really was trying to get off the grid, um, and it wasn't working. Okay, so enough, enough of that. Let's, um, so every good security talk, I tell my students, you have to start by scaring the audience. So here's my obligatory FUD slides. I actually gave a talk, I'll tell you a little bit later, I was, I was visiting the Senate Homeland Security Committee, and, and I started off with this slide. And then I had to explain to him why this slide was funny. And then after, and after you explain to a, a senator why a slide is funny, they will laugh. And it, it was pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this world of software that those even around here is just mind-bendingly incredible how much software there is. Okay, we've got platforms out there, and we all know these platforms. We've got these mobile devices, which is really one of the worst things going on. We've got program, most programmers who graduate with a bachelor's degree go off and do web programming. And they program inside these frameworks. Um, just because you program in a framework doesn't mean you're safe or well-structured. We have a lot of really cool badly used framework um, vulnerabilities we found. But you know, we've got people writing a bazillion back-end software uh, tools that are running on websites. You've got open source software, which is being written by usually very talented people with no, as, 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 my, as Eric likes to say, no adult supervision, um, or very little. And that creates a whole interesting set of other problems. And you've got this cloud thing, and people are deploying more and more things out there. And You've got something which is called the Internet of Things, which basically means everything you ever owned um, will have software in it, and that software will be on the Internet. Okay, that's really, so this just creates an unlimited opportunity and, and, and a global 
ubiquitous attack surface. And this is really frightening. So this is kind of fun. Um, I'm going to show, I'll, I'll show the, uh, the Google, uh, I'll show the Android one too. This is the number of apps out there um, in the most recent data I get, which is pretty recent, June, this past June. 1.5 million apps, okay? And just so I don't sound like a bigot, um, you know, about 1.3 million in, in the Android store. Now, anybody who's got a little bit of gray hanging out places or covered up or wherever or shaved off, whatever you do with your gray, um, if you would have been told 10 years ago or 15 years ago, there's going to be a platform with over a million different programs running on it, you would have looked at the person who said it like they were a complete idiot. Maybe if you were a visionary, but it was just, you know, um, I mean, it's just extraordinary. Now, what, is, what does that mean? <coughs> this, this, is the, this is bachelor's degree production in the, U, in the U.S. Um, this is the Talby survey <coughs> of, of, the top, of the top bachelor's program. And what we see is we're producing right, you know, as of the last projected data, we're going to produce um, 18,000 bachelor's degree students. And this is below what we had at the top of the internet bubble. This is, this is enrollment. So this is, <coughs> this is newly declared majors. And you can see we have about um, 20 some odd thousand newly declared majors. And this um, right here is, is the uh, dot com bubble. So we're not even caught up with the most recent frenetic high. And so look at this date here and look at, look at the curve growing only in 10. And so we are, we're in a point where you know, we're, we're, we're in a point here where um, we're not catching up with the highest point in pr trained programmers, yet we have that absurd growth in software. Now, when I, was, when I was a grad student, I was at my first conference, SOSP, in 1983, and the closing comments, and I believe it was Roy Levin who was giving a con, and he says, you know, there are probably only a good 100 good system programmers. I'll say 1,000 because that makes people feel better, but there's probably only 100 good system programmers in the world. And if you don't have one of them on your project, you're probably doomed to failure. Okay. Well, you know, we've had a lot of time growth since the 80s, you know, uh, but do we have enough good programmers to be producing millions of programs out there? Okay, so, so this, is, this is kind of terrifying for the software assurance world because we're just going to be putting software in more and more places and, and more and more things. So, um, okay, so I guess, I guess that was my FUD slide. Okay, so what are our defenses? So let me talk a little bit about them. And I'm a professor, first line defense, I think it's education. Secure design, secure coding techniques, Vulnerability assessment, so learning how to think in defensive way, learning how to think in offensive way. Um, so these are really cri critical, and they're not part of our undergrad and grad curriculum. There are a few courses out there, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but this is really lacking in what we teach them. This is not in what we teach in our computer security courses. And training. Training is distinct. This is what you do post-graduation. You're out of the university and trying to, you know, trying to keep your skills up. There are a lot of organizations that are good at it, but there's many more organizations that are bad at it. They use you until what you know is useless. Then they cut the project, and you're a 50-year-old laid-off engineer complaining about the young 20-year-olds coming from Iowa and India and China and wherever they 20-year-olds come from, and they're taking my job. And they're not taking your job because you're old. They're taking your job because you know things that are 30 years old and don't know new stuff. So organizations can't be complacent, especially in the security aspect of it. They can't leave it to the universities, and they can't. And employees need to take some uh, incentive here, but um, organizations really do. Policies. Organizations need to have policies in place that require people to behave well, that use best practices. Though I love, uh, I love uh, um, Dilbert's. Uh, it's common on best practices. If all of our companies are using best practices, doesn't that mean we're just all mediocre? Um, so uh, uh, so that I'm always worried when I use that phrase. But we need requirements, procedures, standards for what it means to write software for organizations. Um, tools. Our first line of defense, and, and this is where my, hat, my, uh, uh, my chief scientist with the SWAMP project comes in, 
and I'll talk about that more. We need, we need to use tools to help us. They're not the end of the story. In fact, they're just the very beginning of the story for good security, but they are a necessary lower bound, and we need to be using tools. And we need to be doing in-depth analysis of critical resources. We need to know what our critical resources are, and then we need to be doing really much more in-depth red team, blue teaming of software. Though, if you can't get people to spend money on the second to last one, the last one, forget it. They don't. So let's talk a little bit more about that. OK, so where is secure coding in our curriculum? It typically appears, if anywhere, as a weak unit, not W-E-A-K, but a week seven, day, a one week unit um, as part of a security class. So you learn something about it, it gets, gets tossed in, but there's no, um, there's no extensive, uh, there's no extensive uh, training in that. It's really quite limited. And now there are courses, um, there are courses that are in secure coding design software. They're very rare. Um, they're taught around in a few places. I've looked at one, CMU has one, though they, I talked to the people and it's taught by the folks at CERT in the regular curriculum. They say, but only seven people take it each year. This is one of the biggest CS programs in the country, the world maybe, and only seven people take it. Um, you know, I've seen them in a few other places. I'm not fond of a lot of, I'm, I'm glad they're being taught in the few places. I'm not always fond of what's being taught because they spend too much time on, on more non-technical issues, and they should spend more time on technical issues. Um, but they're just almost non-existent there. And we also need to integrate this with other subjects. I, I teach tutorials on secure coding, and, and, uh, and, and we, we go all over the place to do this. We, we don't charge money to do it. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I have all these slides, so I was talking with my colleagues at a faculty meeting saying, well, we need to teach this. And so somebody said, well, how do we do that? I said, so I handed the memory stick to the database guy and said, here are four slides on SQL injection. Teach these in one lecture. It'll take you 10 minutes, and you can make the world safer. Okay. So we need to be integrating these things in with our courses. You know, of course, when we teach, I teach the undergrad and grad OS courses, and we talk a lot about security there, but we need to be making it even at the processor level, we need to be t talking about um, all the interesting things that are going on at the processor level. OK, so that's education. Professional training, where universities uh, leave off, the professional companies step in. I just grabbed a bunch of people who teach them. The, this top group here pay, charge you a lot of money. The bottom group have free resources for it. You typically pay um, several, a few thousand dollars to send one student for a week of teaching this stuff. It's pretty expensive. Organizations tend to not do a lot of it because it's expensive, but maybe they're doing more of it because there's a bunch of people trying to make a lot of money out there. Um, and typically, you need more than one course. You can spend a week learning C, C++ security, another week learning Java, another week learning PHP, and you can do the web, and on and on and on and on. So, um, and there's an increasing number of free online resources for this. And in fact, we have, we're, we're starting to build podcasts for our stuff. Um, so um, uh, safecode.org has some nice online modules. There's only a few out there, but they're pretty nice. And we're going to start pumping out modules, too, it's, um, as soon as I can spend enough time in Madison to actually record them. So fine? Oh, mo MOOCs, are, MOOCs are really interesting. Um, you know, I had a long, uh, and in fact, one of our, one of our goals for um, either the end of this acad coming academic year or the beginning of the next one is to take our secure coding course and put it on as a, as a MOOC. And we're hoping, we're hoping to do that. I, don't, Dave, I, was, I was a teaching assistant for Dave Patterson when I was a grad student. And, and Dave's an amazing, amazing teacher, just one of the best I know. And, and, he's, and he and I had a long talk with MOOCs about him because he's done a really good job uh, teaching some in software engineering. So um, we're hoping, I'm hoping to benefit from people like him and, and do that. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be a great idea. The question is how to get people to do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, you know, uh, there's just such a draw out into full regular jobs to get people to do that kind of thing, and f who's going to fund it, and and how you going to get people to spend their time.
Okay. So the students are attending the activities, and then they're being reported up to the high school and so forth. So if it is a, if they're doing it only for academic jobs. Okay. Well, that's, that sounds great. Let's, maybe we can talk afterwards, and you can tell me more about these data science incubators, and we can we can talk a little bit more about that. I'd like to, I'd like to hear more about that. <coughs> okay, so um, I'm going to have a few of these takeaway slides. You know, so much software touches the internet, and, and there's so much software that we wrote that wasn't supposed to touch the internet, or when we wrote it, there was no internet. <laughs> Seriously, that's still out there. Your code never dies. It's really scary. Um, that, um, that there are a few things that we're writing that have no attack surface, and the air gap doesn't seem to be robust as it was uh, uh, um, several years ago. There have been, there've been a couple of well-publicized attacks, um, both uh, in the Iraqi command post during the, during the war and also um, the, Iranian, the Iranian centrifuges that show there have been so some sophisticated attacks that jump the air gap. Air gap is when you don't, you don't connect a classified network to the rest of the world. You know, uh, you have to, and so that used to be a high confidence Kind of confidence kind of uh, security, but not as much. So we think every student coming through there needs to have a th thorough exposure to secure programming techniques because what they're going to do is going to affect security. Okay, okay, that's okay. So um, I'm going to start talking about tools in a second. These kind of tools for analyzing programs, and that's going to be a segue into the Swamp Project. But let me just talk about terminology, and I probably don't need to tell this audience anything about terminology, but language shapes thought, as my linguist friends like to say. And so, um, and I'm constantly trying to talk with people out in the real world about what they should be using, what they should be doing. So, say a weakness, that's just a bug in your code. There's something wrong in your code. Your program's not acting the way it should act. It crashes, it prints out seven instead of three. The airplane turns left instead of right, little things like that. And there's this really wonderful taxonomy of weaknesses out there called the Common Weakness Enumeration, um, which is a way of providing a fairly standardized numbering and naming system for things that go wrong with programs. And that's useful when you start building tools and compare things and trying to understand what's wrong with the program. So a vulnerability is when you can take a weakness and actually do something that has a useful uh, bad result to it. I can exfil some data. I can, uh, I can um, you know, you know, I can I can raise my privilege. I can um, I can modify your data. You know, you know, whatever it is, I can disable your system, take away. You know, I can uh, do any sort of number of bad things to that. And an exploit that's the code or sequence or activity that um, allows you to make use of the vulnerability. So it's just a, a little bit of language. Um, I try. Um, I, some, I you know, weakness and vulnerability are used interchangeably, and they shouldn't be. So okay, just pardon the over pedanticness here. <clears throat> okay, so there are, these, there are these tools out there for analyzing programs in various ways to try to detect something's wrong. And this is a substitute for programmers doing the right thing. It should be, in the best environment, it should be an accessory and, and help for programmers who are trying to do the right thing. But it's often a substitute and it shouldn't be. So they're, they're commercial and open source tools. Commercial tools are often easier to use and more polished. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Though often the open source tools are great. Find bugs, um, Bill Pugh's uh, just down, down the street here in College Park um, wrote for, for Java is like the most widely used and probably the most successful. <coughs> in fact, many commercial tools that have Java functionality are just wrappers around find bugs. So it's kind of <coughs> maybe with a few more rules. Um, it's hugely active business space. Lots of academics are turning their research into tools. Um, and, and there are new companies popping up all the time. There are some companies that run tools as a service. Um, Veracode, for example, is one of the most well-known ones. Um, I'm not now, there are <coughs> there's one company that's offering a free tool as a service version of their commercial tool, but it requires you to download a 300 megabyte compressed image that you then have to install that takes up almost a gigabyte on your disk. And then when you run a 20-line C program through it, it produces three megabytes of something that you then upload to get it analyzed and viewed. And so while it's free and easy as a service, a lot of people find this overwhelming and annoying. And, it, and it's almost no easier to use a tool as a service than it is to uh, actually just install a tool yourself. So it's, yeah? Are they running garbled servers? <coughs> Pardon? Are they running garbled servers? Um, 
you know, Lord knows what they're doing in there. Garbled circus, it could be, yeah, could be anything in there. Okay. Um, so the most popular and large part of this space are the static analysis tools. And these are the one, and these are very attractive because they're tools for almost every language and framework. So not only are there tools for Ruby, there's tools for Ruby's on Rails and all the other things. There's tools for all sorts of development frameworks. They know about the semantics of the framework, which helps find things. They run on typic, they run on source, they run on bytecode, there's DEX tools too, and uh, binary tools. So there's a whole variety of tools for different spaces. Um, they're the simplest of the, all those kind of tools to use because you don't have to run the program. So you don't need input data sets, you don't need installation, you don't need to execute the program. It doesn't even have to fully build properly to run the tool. So they're, they're valuable that way. Um, there are some tools that require your code to fully build, and that's actually a very legitimate and useful thing, and I'll show you why. Um, these tools are surprisingly big and hard to install. They, uh, you know, I've seen tools in the three to 10 megabyte download range for the tool, Lord knows what's in there, and they take even more space um, when they're there. They have a ton of options. Uh, you know, there was a long time ago, Ken, uh, Ken Thompson uh, wrote an article, Cats Don't Have Options, because um, he got really tired when the cat command got something like 75 options, or we ran up single letters for that. So um, these, these programs are more complicated, so if you don't set the options right, you either get overwhelmed with irrelevant reports, um, or you just get too few to be useful. So, and, and every tool gives you different reports in a different format. Um, some, some of them, uh, I'm generously saying many of them, translate these results to CWE notation, so you can at least compare across tools. A lot of tools don't. Um, and some tools are really fast, and some tools are really deep, and some tools are tunable that you can kind of pick what part of the space you want, and a few are sound. Um, but they're really slow and they're very specialized. And so, but you got to pick somewhere in that, you got to pick what you want there. So, um, and if you pick one, you lose some of the other. You know, you're not, so that's, uh, and, and, you know, a company like Caverity, of course, has made their business model on their tools being fast. Because they know if their tools aren't fast, nobody will run them. Okay, and so no comment about what that implies. Okay, <clears throat> so when you go to these software assurance meetings, and there's people who meet all the time to talk about software assurance out there, um, uh, people d d interested in assurance and the software supply chain problem and uh, all, all sorts of interesting problems, you hear this thing over and over again that different tools are good at different things. So running a single tool is really limited, limiting, and the con commercial vendors don't want, you to know, don't want you to think that. Their tool is the best. But what we see again and again in the studies that compare tools, more about that in, in a little bit, because how do you do a study that compares tools? That's a problem. Um, and maybe not in the ways you're thinking. <coughs> uh, uh, it comes up that different tools are distinctly good at different things. Okay, so, um, but, and then we have a lot of dynamic tools, dynamic code analysis tools, things that check for, for memory errors and taint analysis and things like that. These are, these are very useful, um, interesting tools. They do require an execution environment, and representative data, and you're only going to test what you exercise. Um, and these tools tend to be unfortunately slow, so it discourages many people from running them, but they can be really, really good. So they're really, really good if you have the patience. And then there's dynamic testing tools. There's a million tools that will hammer on your website and look for your, your web server being installed right and your web pages being formatted right, and you're not, you're not allowing redirection, and you're not allowing <coughs> various kinds of privileges and things like to happen. And these need a complete client and server environment to, to work out well. So they have a diff more difficult installation process. Okay, so um, not tools. Okay, in the real world, there's a lot of resistance to running even the most basic of tools. And, and, there's, a, and there's a bunch. And so when you go out to companies saying, you know, why don't you, you know, you should be, you should be doing uh, in-depth code analysis. We can't do it. Because they say, okay, just run a tool. Oh, we can't do it. <laughs> and we go, okay, why not? Well, the commercial tools are expensive. They're hard to install. You have to keep them up to date. The reports are not easy to understand, so we have to train all our users on how to understand these reports because they don't know what the tools are telling them. Um, so getting the options set right is difficult. Um, 
If you try to fire up a tool in a legacy code base, you get the number of reports proportional to the number of lines of code. Anybody ever t taken a legacy code and turned on all the warnings in their compiler? <coughs> and people are laughing. That should, that should not be a funny thing, right? But so you can think of these tools as the compiler warnings on steroids. In fact, compilers are getting better and better and better and finding more and more of these things. These things are being integrated into compilers. And if we had, if our compilers were good enough, we actually wouldn't need these tools. Um, if they were, you know, if we, if we weren't worried about code generation as much and more worried about code quality. So, um, so running it on legacy code bases is, is, is a problem. Let me tell you something we did on our own project. And I, I said I was talking to a group of um, software test uh, executives and managers at a, at, a, at a completely different kind of forum. And, I, and they said, well, how can we deal with this problem? I said, well, what we did in our project was that we turned on all the warnings. And the requirement was every time you make a commit, you have to have decreased the number of warnings by at least one. That's it. So you know the number of warnings in your system will be monotonically decreasing. And for active code files, you get really, and programmers treat warnings like potato chips. You cannot eat just one. When you fix a warning as a programmer, you go, I'll fix another one. And you tend to get about 10 to 20 or 30 until the programmer gets bored, and then says, damn it, I'll commit the file. So if you're dealing with a legacy code base and you can't shut down your development, you just say, make the number of warnings monotonically decreasing. It's easy to build some scripts that, that monitor that and yell at the programmer if they don't do it. It's no, no big deal. And you can converge over a year into a really clean code base. So there are methodologies for cleaning things up. Um, and you know, security flaws uh, slow down software delivery. So um, a lot of software managers simply don't want them reported because they won't deliver their software. And if they don't deliver their software, they get fired. If they deliver their software and they get hacked, they say, well, everybody gets hacked. So it's, it's, uh, there's an interesting, yes? Okay, so are people not running tools because what they don't know they won't get sued over? Um, you know, we've seen some of that, um, and uh, but there's a there's getting to be an increasing awareness of due diligence, and and so you know the very first time we did an in-depth code analysis was back in the 90s of the of the of the Condor system at Wisconsin, this this batch scheduling system that's used in Tens of thousands of sites around the world. You know, Pixar uses it. Every, I mean, uh, uh, companies use it for for uh, doing processor design. It did the Higgs boson data analysis. I mean, science, e-science runs on this scheduling system. And and Marone Livney, who's uh, my colleague of many years and also a very good friend, you know, he said, "Well, I don't want to look bad." And I said, "Look, hey, well, I said I promise." So if the attitude should be that if somebody's not evaluating their code and reporting vulnerabilities, they're either, they're not reporting because they're not looking and that's not good, or they're looking and finding and not telling you and that's not good. And I, and I said, and so what it turned out for Marone was he's got an enormous amount of credit as running a active security program. And every time he reports things, people actually feel some kind of relief that the thing's being found and fixed. So he's actually professionally benefited and the N National Science Foundation, which is one of its primary funders, is enormously happy that this was all going on. And I think the same thing happens in the real world. You know, we're, we're relieved when we see things fixed. So, but I don't, you know, I think, I think that's a problem, but it's a fading problem. Well, yes, the question is, why should you fix things that are false positives? Oh, this, this is not a short answer question. It's a really good question. Um, you know, there are some things a tool will report that are just simply wrong. And they're not, they're in no way a flaw in the code. The tools, because of the limitations of static analysis, either the fundamental limitations in static analysis or code complexity that the tool, the tool stops short of a deep analysis, um, they're just tool gets it wrong. And most of the tools have ways of annotating the code 
saying, believe me, this pointer is never null. And so, and that's, a, and that's not a bad exercise because that's like putting asserts in your code. That's like putting pragmas in your code to, to, say, to say that you know certain behaviors are there. So that's not a bad response to it. There are other ones that are minor flaws. This flaw will only allow me to put a little blue dot up in the top left-hand corner of the screen that nobody will ever notice. But combined with that blue dot and something else, I might be able to build an exploit that you didn't expect. I've watched um, the people who do it for our government do exploits. And they say, well, I can only own bit 17 and 18 of the return address of this function. The next week later, say, we have full control of the system for full. And, and, and you listen to them, and they go, well, we did this, and we did this, and we did this, and we did this. And there was this other problem over here. And combined together, I somehow got enough bits that I constructed it. So you know, you want it above, I mean, the, I told you it wasn't a short answer question. I'm sorry. Um, above, beyond all of this, it's an economic issue. We can't fix everything. We've got to fix the most important things first. And so somehow, we really would like the tools to prioritize what they tell us and hope the priorities are in some reality um, reflecting the seriousness of the vulnerability. So um, yes, sir. So, th so the question is, you know, shouldn't we be doing management education so managers can know um, how to make a decision of whether a security vulnerability should stop a, uh, a release or not? And, and the answer is absolutely, we should, we should have that. Um, I'm focusing on the programmers right here. And, and actually, if you looked at my to-do list, there is, there is a tutor the tutorial chapter. We've been putting out tutorial sections um, uh, quite prolifically. And the one that I don't have is the executive and manager briefing. That's on my list of things to, of things to do in, in my uh, free time or, or upcoming. Actually, in the upcoming academic year, I hope to, to put together a briefing that's like that. I don't know exactly what I'm going to tell them yet. So if you have thoughts on that, tell me. But I, I know we have to do one of those things. I mean, I totally agree with that. OK. <coughs> so, um, so the takeaway, and this is a rather self-serving one because it's going to be a segue into the SWAMP project. Um, uh, you know, let's try to make tools easier to run to users, and um, let's provide help to the tool users and also to the tool builders. And, and the tool builders are the people just coming up, whether it's an assistant professor trying to come up with the next cool idea of how to uh, find problems in code, or whether it's a startup company trying to do this. Um, there's a lot of thing, advantages the big guys have that the little guys don't have, and I'll try to talk about them. OK, so let me talk a little bit about the Swamp Project and what we've been working on. And, and this will be, you know, this is kind of uh, the middle of the talk. Then I'll get to some fun code stuff at the end if you stick around. Uh, yes, sir. Before you uh, dive into that, is there another takeaway besides these, these designing languages, uh, programmers to use that don't require tools to make better and Oh, you're, so should we be designing languages um, that programmers should use that don't have a lot of these problems? And I'm going to actually talk about it later on. The answer is absolutely yes. And let, let me, let me, and, and there's so many cool, cute languages out there, you know, you know, Swift and Go and things like that that are just really fun and we should really be using. I mean, there's some really fun new languages out there and I'm really excited about a lot of them. But I, I'll, and I, I'll sort of give away something I'm going to say a little later, but I think we can do something, you know, and, and C is a 1970s language. I mean, golly, I was so excited in, uh, what was it, 1972 when we got the, we got the version 7 tape from Bell Labs and we installed it on our PDP-8 and it was just really fun and mind-blowing at the time. So, <coughs> and that's, we're still programming in that same damn language. Um, but why not have, those of you who work in tools, why not have tools that tell us about what parts of the code they cannot analyze properly and have you clean up your, and clean up your code so even if you're going to write in one of these horrible languages, you can write in a dialect. Of the, there's people talk about secure subsets. There's good work in that. People have talked about that. Why not have tools that tell us about that in our code so we can modify our existing code or converge our existing code into code that at least can be analyzed well so the tools can help us? OK. 
Okay, so that's 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 the flip side of I would prefer what you suggested, but there's a flip side for all that legacy C and C plus plus code that's um, killing it. Okay, so DHS gave us a bucket load of money to try to help improve software assurance. Um, so it's basically an open facility that you can upload your code and get it assessed by a whole bunch of good tools. And so, if, um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's mainly at the University of Wisconsin Mortgage Institute, one of our research institutes. Um, Marone Livney of Condor fame is, is our project director. I'm chief scientist. Um, Indiana University, Von Welch is our uh, chief security officer and our um, identity management group is, at, uh, is Jim Basney's group at, at, Indi at, uh, at University of Illinois. Um, in Urbana-Champaign. And so uh, we're actually standing up an operational center where you can come and upload your code and run it and, and get it assessed. So um, I mean, Rowan always likes to talk about building communities. And so the first thing we're trying to do is try to raise awareness and get people interested in software assurance so they want to um, upload their code. So, so people who want to use the technology, people who want to practice the technology, can both come together and benefit from each other. And so, so for software developers, it's a place to, to easily access these assessment tools where you don't have to worry about installing and maintaining or buying or tuning or adjusting or anything about it. You can just get your code up there. For tool developers, we want to provide a lot of the automation and infrastructure you would need to make your tool run well. And I'll tell you more about that in some detail because this is a more technical audience. But um, there are things that companies like Coverity and Fortify have spent a lot of time and money doing that a small group can't afford to do. And we're, we've done that in free software and giving it away. So you can, you can make your tools easy to use. And I'll tell you about that. For researchers, we have a ton of assessment data. And if you choose to make, you know, that people, researchers can study quantitatively. And if you choose to make your raw data public because you're doing open source software, um, you can then study the software assurance process. So there's a lot of data here. As the longer the swamp runs, the more data we accumulate. As software stays there over many revisions, we accumulate software assurance data that parallels the updates in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the various repositories. So there's a lot of stuff you can study that's interesting. And for teachers, we, run, we let classes. We've had, we've had several university classes use it as, as a vehicle. Um, some intro classes require it. Um, some uh, security classes, a graduate security class was using it. And we even had a high school programming class use it. And that was kind of fun. You know, where you can't, you can't turn your code into the instructor until it comes out clean by these three tools or something like that. So, so it's, it's, we have a variety of communities um, are, uh, that, that are using it. So, um, so the goal is you can upload your software package easy, easily. Um, you can add tools easily. I mean, some of this, I'm sorry, this sounds like marketing, and I, I really hate that. Um, <clears throat> um, really important is that you can access multiple tools, and we benefit from um, Secure Decisions Code DX tool. Uh, we didn't write that. We're not writing tools. We're building the infrastructure to make all this work, and that's a surprising amount of work. Um, so uh, there's a tool out there. There's several, but one, we, one we're working with and we like brings together the output from multiple tools and gives it to you in a single unified format, unified labeled, and, and a nice viewer. So you don't have to understand the output of multiple tools. You get to look at it in one way. Though we actually support several results viewers. So we're not, you know, you don't have to use that. Um, we have a lot of software controls that you can make. When you define a project, you can say, who can see my software in the database? You can say everybody or nobody or just my friends. Who can, see, who can see the assessment results? Same kind of thing. So, so you, can, you can decide how public you want to make your results. And then, of course, we have all this data that we're, we're, people are starting to study. OK. So we want the newbie, the, the unexperienced program. Th this, this first bullet is my goal for almost any software I want to build. I want software that helps accelerate the beginner up to a higher level so they're doing better stuff. But I want experienced people. Um, also, to be able to get their work done, I don't, I don't want it to be. A, I, they should find the stuff they know how to already do go faster. And uh, the last one I've already said. So, okay. So we have this term called continuous assurance, and most of you know about continuous integration. 
Continuous integration is the process of constantly doing builds as you do commits, doing building and testing as you go along to validate your software in the development process. Continuous assurance is a natural extension of it. It just means any time you're going to be doing an insurance activity like running these tools, every time you do an update of the software or any of its dependencies or, any, or, the, tool it's, or the tools that are using, anything that gets updated should trigger a new assessment. So, we should be, so that should be going continuously. So that's, that's what continuous assurance is. Anybody know? We, we thought we introduced this term. But it turned out I found this term. You know, I love it when I'm doing research and I think there's something brand new and I discover there's a classic source for it. Anybody know the classic source for this term? It's in the orange book. That or and and people, people deride the orange book, but it was a fascinating, informative, interesting document. It, it, it's, it's a little dated and naive from our point of view, but there were some really, really good ideas, important concepts in the orange book. Um, uh, about you know uh, how to develop secure systems and designing hierarchies of what different levels of security are. It's, it's there's some good there's some good stuff in there. I mean I wouldn't want to base my life on that book, but it's pretty there's some good stuff. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to get people fixing stuff sooner because you know it, this is a ballistic right. The, soon, the earlier that you make these fixes, the earlier you detect these problems, the cheaper they are to fix. So we want to try to fix them as early as possible. There's really good data out there. What's the cost for fixing a bug or security flaw at different stages in the process? You know, anywhere from, you know, while you're typing it to, you know, in testing phases to in release checking to into post-release. And, and, and so you, I, I don't have to reproduce that. So we want to try to make it really easy to do this early as possible. And we want to try to make a cultural change. Um, remember that we're talking to not security people all the time. We're trying to talk to the people developing the software out in the world. And not every organization is like a Google or a Microsoft that have fundamental security cultures built into the companies. Um, and in fact, most companies are not like that. I had a very long, interesting discussion with the, C the, new, with the CIO and new CISO, uh, actually the new CIO who just hired a CISO at Target. Because Target had these interesting problems. We had this interesting event. I went to buy some cell phones um, uh, for my partner and her daughter. And, at, and we went to Target and they had a great deal. Five bucks, put them on my contract for new iPhones. OK, so we went, we went and bought. Um, uh, and so the guy went to the terminal at Target and says, well, I can activate it for you. And it's obviously some software layer on top of all the um, you know, AT&T and Verizon and everybody else, T-Mobile stuff. And so he says, well, I need, I, need your, uh, I need your phone number and password for your AT&T account. And I need, your, I, need your, I need your last four digits of social security number and I need your zip code. And I go, WTF, except I spelled out the acronym. And, and, and I go, but you shouldn't need these stuff. And he said, well, you know, AT&T doesn't trust us. Well, why should, I go, why should I trust you? And I go, here's a terminal sitting here in the walkway with people walking by and anybody can look at the screen. They're not blanking out fields. And I'm just, I'm just appalled at this, at this lack of, 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 of privacy. And, and Target had, so I sent email off to this new CIO who's just, because they just fired their previous one because of all the credit card problems. And I actually got the guy on the phone and, I, and I'm talking with him on a conference call in the CISO and say, you guys should really fix these things. And, and you obviously have some software layering problems and, and information sharing problems and things like that. He says, don't worry, we'll fix it. We're target, we'll fix it. And I go, well, you know, what are you going to do to validate this? And so, and so, and this is target had just gone through, and this guy had just taken a seat that was still warm from the body of the person that was fired or killed. I don't know what target did with him. Um, and, so, and so organizations at that level which when are confronted with things that are fairly substantive and have just gone through a trauma, still are not responding. So, okay, so, so you might as well stop doing computer security research and go write video games or something because nobody cares. No. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, yes, sir.
Right, absolutely. So CISO, CIOs are often, are often not aware. And you're absolutely right. But here they had um, some smart ass professor on the phone, you know, and who was telling them and doing a, you know, a very, you know, a very uh, straightforward presentation, you know, uh, and, these, and, they sh and these people w were sensitized to security threat. And so somebody was actually walking them through it step by step of what the issues were and maybe, maybe there's some possible remediations. And their biggest fear was publicity. Their fear was not the technical problem. Their biggest fear was the publicity. So, yeah. Um, yes, sir. Yes. So, so why, why isn't the continuous assurance process of the Japanese car manufacturing program, why hasn't that been adopted in the software program? Well, you know, it, it took a surprisingly long time for American car manufacturers to adopt those practices. But now they do, and, and it's really impressive how much of an influence that's had. I, I was just at the Ford F-150 plant this last summer touring that. Fantastic tour, by the way, if you're, if you're, into, if you're, into, any, if, if you're into shiny, pretty machines at all, or, or into or just how things work. It's a really good tour. They do a good job. <coughs> um, uh, why don't we do it in software? Uh, boy, I mean, we're, we're not even getting people to do bad security practices. Trying to get them to do thorough, complete, end-to-end um, -end security practices, I think, is even harder. I think there's a question as to whether the Japanese car manufacturers have embraced it in their software. Um, that I don't know. The, I, don't, I don't know the answer to. I know. I do know. Whenever when, when we hear about these great exploits against cars the here, source the source code that came out from the Sony from the Toyota and Motorola stuff that isn't that is not ours. Right, right. I, what you know, we we've seen. Well, yeah. So so yeah. So the software supply chain is a very serious issue. In fact, there are tools out there that will take your program, especially in Java, and actually build a, uh, a dependency model and then give you summaries of known vulnerabilities down your dependency chain. So people are very worried about the software supply chain, SCRM, you know, supply chain resource management, in the software world. So that's an area that people are concerned about. But you know, like anything, uh, getting people to globally embrace that. I mean, we're having a hard time people evaluating the software they write, let alone evaluating the software that they're dependent upon. They don't even know. It, look at OpenSSL. People had OpenSSL in places they had no idea about. And so trying to figure out what your dependence chain is is actually a pretty challenging. So, so is there a role for the cloud in <coughs> providing that kind of analysis of somebody else's software that you're dependent on? Oh, ab absolutely. In fact, we're working. Uh, one of the companies that does a really nice job building tools for the software dependence in the Java space is Sonotype. And we're actually working to integrate Sonotype tools in, so we'll build um, we'll we'll build a supply chain model of that, and either report known vulnerabilities or actually take swamp data that we've done for those various components and integrate it all up together. So yeah, absolutely, the supply chain model is is something we're very sensitive about. That's the fifth community. You know, I talked about tool software developers and tool developers and research software process researchers and educators. The fifth the fifth community I didn't mention. Was the was the supply chain management community, and so because um, my slide was getting too full, but <coughs> can't get anything past you guys. Okay, so currently in the swamp we have 16 tools installed and running: C, C++, Java, Python, Ruby, and Android. I do Android separately because their tools are specialized for that, and there's all sorts of magic that happens in Android apps that have to do with permissions and manifests and things like that. So there's a significant layer there. We have we have a commercial we have one commercial tool currently installed and momentarily with the next release we have two more commercial tools coming out that you can use for free on your open source software. Why are vendors doing this? 
don't, it's a good question, but they're out there. Parasoft, J test and C test, a lot of open source tools coming up. Red Lizard, great company down in Australia. Brilliant. They have really good code analysis engines in there. Their Goana tool, Gramatech, many of you know that. Tom, Tom Reps, uh, one of my colleagues, he's principal there. Code Sonar is coming out, and then some new, new Ruby tools are coming out. We're, um, we already have tools. I mentioned fa we already have tools from places uh, like uh, we have Google's open source tools. We're bringing in the Facebook and Fair tool, JSLint, JSLint, Code Sniffer. We're getting PHP and CSS tools coming in, JavaScript tools coming in. They're, these are all free to use if you have it for open source projects. If you're a commercial project and you upload your code, you uh, you're limited to certain tools. All the open source tools. I don't. I think one of the, I think one of the commercial tools allows it. But if you're an open source project, then you can use any of these tools for free. And so so you upload your code. It goes. Uh, it has to build. And um, by the way, if, I, I know some people taking slides. Um, Anybody that sends me an email, I'll send you a PDF of the whole talk, so you don't have to do that. I hate, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'm happy to share this. All there's nothing secret in here. Um, so you just check off which tools you want, and then it runs against all the tools that are appropriate for your language. So you run against all the Java tools, or C, C++ tools, or Ruby tools, or whatever, and the results come out in a single viewing experience. Uh, you can either get a raw listing or um, or use the code DX tool, and we hope sometime in the current quarter we're going to have the TOEIF tool, which is another alternative for viewing integrated results. Yes, sir. No, no, we're not. We're not. We're, they're, we're not looking for uh, you know common or, or or copied code in the tool. This, we're looking. We're, these are co these are tools specifically for doing static analysis for flaws in the code. I, you know, I, I think there are services already on the web for doing that. I know there's a service at Berkeley. I don't know if it's still up or not that we've used in the past. Um, but it's not something we've specific. You know, we're, we're, we have a, a lot of stuff to do. And, and that's, that's not, unfortunately not high enough on our priority list to worry about it. Um, so one of the things we, we're working on heavily is the automation to streamline the experience. So for users, you don't have to worry about tool settings. We've worked very hard to try. We're not worried about too long variable names. And we're not worried about curly brackets on the wrong line. In an organization that has a strong coding standard culture, that's great. And it's great that organizations enforce that. But we're trying to be a neutral assurance facility. And we're not trying to just enforce you know, clear, you know, consistency in the code. So we try to make sure that anybody that uses it will get something useful out of it. Um, uh, we automatically integrate into the build, and that's where I'll spend some time talking about it. We allow you to do direct pulls from your repository. So every time you do a repository update, the new code can, this is part of the continuous, continuous assurance. Um, and direct exports from your IDE. So you should be able to push a button when you're in IntelliJ or, um, or one of the other you know, pick your favorite uh, IDE. You should be able to push a button, and the code gets uploaded to the swamp and triggers a new assessment. We want to. Um, this the last one's kind of rough right now because um, I had some graduate students, not staff, working on that, and they left. Stupid students graduate. It's really rude of them. Um, and so we have a whole new group of grad students coming in the fall that are going to start attacking um, various things, including that. Um, we we have a lot of requests for Windows C Sharp .NET and that's our next major environment. And then we'll start moving into Mac OS after that as a segue into, uh, into iOS. But that's uh, a little further down the road. <coughs> so, yes, sir. Are you buying other browsers besides Windows and Chrome? <coughs> what do you have in mind? Um, those are probably lower priority because if you just do a survey of which languages are out there deployed, we're trying to hit. So, but you know, if, if somebody, but if somebody has a tool for that, um, and it, uh, and 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 they come to us with a tool, we're we're usually pretty good about installing it. It doesn't take that long to update the infrastructure, to, especially for interpreted languages um, that don't have complex build monitoring. Uh, 
it's usually pretty quick for us to install a new tool. So if, a, if some people come to us with a tool, we're, off, we're usually pretty responsive to that. The, tool, the source doesn't have to be open source. But if you want to access the commercial tools, our agreement with those companies requires us, requires your code to be open source. Yes, and by open source, you mean Oh, yes, student projects don't, don't, don't fall, are no, no issue. You can, they can run against all tools. Okay, open source is kind of a, there's a longer, more complex legal description. And open source was kind of the easiest short phrase. But course, course projects definitely fall under the category of running under everything. Yeah. Uh, your tool, the tool set you're doing is, is some, so you talk about the difficulty of setting options and things like that. Um, the tool set you're doing is uh, tools for a few of those tools. And then you run a quick look with some tools. And then that advises, well, I found these problems. You might want to run this, this, and that following that. We, we don't. We, we, I, I haven't seen that explicitly done. I, I, I think you can conceptually do that, um, but I don't know of anybody, any tools set up to do that specifically, trying to do a, a triage kind of effect there. So Would that be something that you might think about doing in the future? It'd be something we'd love to have somebody investigate, and we'd help them do that in the swamp. So if you wanted to do it, we'd be happy to work with you. We're always looking. We bring in lots of partners because you know, we have bandwidth limits like anybody. Yes, sir. So, so that's, that's an interesting question. So why would organizations, maybe commercial organizations, maybe um, hesitant about uploading their code to the swamp? There's, there's several things going on. Um, first are the things we do, and, and then there's some new options coming up, which are interesting. Um, uh, you know, we try to run an environment with, you know, we do, the, we do our, we, do, try, we have our own security team. So we're constantly doing, evaluating our own system. We're running our own code through these tools. We're doing our own uh, blue teaming. Um, uh, every as the interesting thing is everything runs in virtual machines. So your assessments your and your programs are all uploaded. And then in order to run an assessment, so anytime your stuff is running, we basically take a virtual machine, provision it with a tool, provision it with your program. We run the tools. And that virtual machine has no access outside of its own private network. That the assessment finishes, we stop the virtual machine and then extract uh, the results. So there's never any, so when you do a build process or run a tool, we're running outside code. That code runs completely isolated. So, so we're, doing, we're doing pretty strong isolation of that. And so we're trying to do, the system's been designed from day one to provide strong isolation. Um, we're also currently in an exercise of producing the swamp in a box. So you can run your own swamp. Um, and, and so if you, uh, so if you, there are problems not just with um, organizations, but with national boundaries and being able to move certain kinds of code places and running into regulations, international laws. So we're, allowing, we're going to allow other people to run their own independent swamp and if they want to do that. We're also going to bring up a high side swamp, a classified swamp, so for government users who, who can't cross the air gap. And that will run in a different space. And I, I imagine other com countries may want to do the same thing. So, so we're trying. Well, there's a lot of possibilities there. One is I think we're doing a pretty good job. I, you know, uh, we're going to have we're going to have flaws like anybody else. Um, but there's also opportunities for you to run your own coming up. Yes, absolutely. We run our own tools against our own code. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's open. Sign up. I didn't put the URL on there. It's continuousassurance.org. Continuousassurance.org. Or just Google Swamp Project. I'm sorry I didn't put Okay, let me let me move on. Okay, so this is this is the cartoon form. You, you know, you have a bunch of packages, you select a bunch of tools, you select which platforms, because there's lots of different Linux and you know, and there's Android and Windows and which Java interpreter. You you tell the swamp to run the assessment, you get output. The, uh, you pick which results viewer you want, and you view the results. Okay, so that's the 
cartoon form. And everything, and this, this completely runs in a virtual machine here. The assessment part runs in a virtual machine. And it has no access to any anything except its lo own local virtual machine storage. It has no file systems mounted. So it gets provisioned, run, quiesced, and then we extract from the virtual machine the results. And that's, that's one of our isolation capabilities. OK, so the automation that we've worked on pretty hard is trying to apply, um, applying a new s tool to a software package. We're trying to make it really simple. OK, and so OK, let, let me get past some of this and just jump into. So what makes it hard to apply a tool naively to a software package? So here's our, here's our basic simple tool. You have one source file. Uh, it normally gets compiled to your executable. And, the, and so we go gcc foo.c, for example. And when you want to run the tool, you say tool foo.c with a similar command line, and you get the tool output. So that's the naive view of what a tool do, does. Now, unfortunately, um, real software is a bit more complex. We have multiple source files. And these separately compile into object files. And object files combine into libraries and executables. But different source files come from different directories. And the same source file may be combined into multiple libraries and multiple executables to produce multiple different libraries or multiple completely separate programs. Um, then we have build generators. So a lot of the, the make files, the, the, the program, the source files get generated, the make files get generated at build time. The source files and include files get generated at runtime. The programs that generate the source files and get built at runtime. So, um, so it's not obvious what to as assess or even get a list. Um, and if you look at distributed software, builds are done so many mind blowingly different ways, including custom scripts and tools and generators, that you just it's just really hard to statically look at a directory and figure out what the heck you should be assessing in that directory or even having it available. OK, <clears throat> so um, let me just show you. This is, this is a reasonable schematic of what a build process looks like today for a serious software project. So at the top, you've got you know, your system data, your system include files. You've got library files that aren't there that somehow your build is going to have to obtain. Um, you've got system library files, and you've got tools. Um, the user, you've also got documents and unused source files because every build is full of source files that nobody ever uses anymore. You know, forget about unused code in a source file. How about unused source files, getting rid of those because they're just there distracting you. Um, so, um, you know, this, you know, the <coughs> when you start the build, you know, you get these green boxes. The build, you, you configure and build whatever top level thing you've got. Um, we'll start generating make files and generating source files um, as one of its first things to do. Um, <clears throat> and what we really want to do is analyze the generated source files, the system include files, the missing library files, um, the project source files down at the bottom, the ones that happen to be there. Those are easy to find. And so we, that's what we want to really analyze all of that. Um, and you know, we have to deal with all the stuff that's generated. The generator, like an RPC stub generator or a partial generator, sometimes has to build at install time. So the thing that's going to generate the programs you're going to uh, analyze actually has to be generated. So you're dealing with several levels of indirection here. Um, and this is a, and then. Um, these are all the files we have to look at, the generated source files, the executables, the libraries that are going to go into a software assurance tool, one of these analysis tools. OK. OK, so you know, what executables exist, what source files to build. Um, we, uh, um, you know, so all this is summarizing into this blue that requires some amount of automation. Um, so, uh, and especially if we want to do whole program analysis as well. And there are some tools out there that want to do whole program analysis. So what do we do? So here's, here's a simple picture of, of what you're seeing in a lot of directories. You've got a source file way there on the left that builds, only builds into executable one. 
But executable one also has things from this other directory that goes into two projects, and you've got source files to build here. So this is, this is the kind of stuff we're trying to figure out. Um, and it gets worse because macros and pound defines and all that kind of stuff mean the source you're looking at isn't actually the source you're going to analyze. You've got um, include files. If you don't know where the include file is coming from, you don't actually know which include file you're including. And, and, and there can be real big variations in versions of the same include file. And there's language dialects, X11, all these kinds of things. You know, which version of C++ am I actually analyzing? And it has a big effect on the semantics of the program. So, um, and then you need to know, you know, so libraries and directories and stuff like that. So how do you deal with that? So, um, uh, so a lot of tools assume that all the sources are in a single directory. That doesn't always work. Um, uh, a lot of tools provide recipes on how for a particular build system to extract this information. Um, it's really hard to keep that up to date. And even if you do, you don't get generated stuff. Um, you make assumptions about the build environment. And you s insert a shim into the, into the build environment somewhere. You know, you capture, you'll stick some name variable in there. But that's hard to make sure that you, if, uh, sometimes the make files are generated and you don't always capture uh, all the right places to intercept. Um, and, uh, uh, and there are command line options that if you don't get the command line options right, you're not analyzing the right code. OK, so what do we do? So the basic idea is you take the build system and the unmonitored source package and you monitor the build. You watch the build happen. So this is what all the big kids do. Coverity, Fortify, IBM AppScan, things like that. This is what they do. They've built all this stuff. And they monitor the build. In the C and C++ world, you watch the system calls and you find the compiler phases. Whenever you see a compiler phase go by, you grab it and all its options. And now you know exactly what happened, every file, every directory. You capture the build, the compile and link steps. If you're using Ant, Gradle, Maven in the, in the Java world, there is a callback interface that you can intercept all this stuff. So you basically monitor the build and you build something we call the build artifact. <coughs> And then we have a driver, um, which is a supply tool that says, I, want, I have a little pattern that says to apply tool foo. This is the options I'm going to use against a file or against the whole directory. And I take all the build information. And that plus the uh, formula of how to run a tool tells me how to run a tool against every file exactly the way it was compiled and built. And so, um, and so we have this for both C C++ and Java, and it's all set up and very table driven. And if you want this, send me an email and I'll give it to you. And your tool can run as effectively as the big kids tool. You'll not miss a single option. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the, um, my virus scanner just said it's time to check viruses. Okay, because obviously it doesn't trust any of you out there. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, so it says we do it for C, C++, Java, Ant, Gravel, Ma Ant Maven, Gradle, and uh, handles Android, and it captures all these various things, and it's open and free. Yeah. Have you given thought to how you could characterize the results of something like the binary? You know, this combination of two, what am I, am I saying is now I'm going to assume it, what am I going to do? We've thought a lot about that, and um, we've been, we haven't done anything with it. We're, we're, tr we're trying to just get the results out there so people can run them and compare. So, for example, you might want to say, I know that there are no CWEs, MMS examples in this book. Right. Yeah, th there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of really cool things we can do with the results. And, and, there's, and I think as a vehicle for, and we're not, we want to be a vehicle for, we're not going to do this all. We need, we need partners to do those kind of things. And we'd love to see people working on that. Let me, let me move on a, li a little bit. Um, uh, let me get past some of this stuff. Um, I, what I want to talk about are some, some limiting factors. Because um, it's not, you know, here's this wonderful swamp, right? So come and use it, right? But, you know, getting an organization to use a tool, any tool, let alone our service, and we end up having a dialogue that where the answers to the various comments are what? No thanks, we don't really need it. All right, 
No, no, but we can't afford it. Did, didn't we take care of that already? I'll show you what the questions are in a minute, but those are the answers that we get. And tools need some serious improvement. You know, slow limit, you know, you know fast, deep uh, sound. Yeah, right. Um, and we don't really know how good these tools are, and there's some very interesting non-technical limitations to that. And even if we, uh, um, it's hard to know how good the tools are, and if we know how good they are, we can't talk about it. And I want to talk about why we can't talk about it. Okay, so um, software assurance groups usually end up in organizations when they're born in the testing group. It shouldn't. They should be a separate group. And these people don't understand security. And so don't think it's important. I, we, we, we were talking with a group of corporate um, testing uh, directors and managers, and it really was surprising how many quest naive questions they had about software assurance and security testing. They didn't even know the existence of half these tools. OK, that was interesting. And so even if you, so even if you convince them they need it, they can't afford it. Or they can't afford to install the tools, or they can't afford to maintain them, or they can't take the time off of development to train the programmers. And uh, even if they do that, they're worried about the delay in the release cycle. These are all real concerns we're getting from people. And even if they think it makes sense, um, uh, they can't afford the price of the tool because these commercial tools are expensive. And they're afraid of the open source tools. And they said, well, but we did a risk assessment. There's this amazing confusion in the world about, well, we assessed risk, so now we are OK, right? I mean, we're working, we have a separate project. We're working with uh, container port security. And come talk to me if you want to. It's a really fun project. <coughs> um, and, we're and we're trying to assess the software that maintains the databases and controls the container ports. And, and there are so many studies of the risk associated with container ports. And nobody's looking at the security of the software. And they keep saying, well, I've got this risk management report. Aren't we done? this risk assessment report. And it's just mind-boggling, the confusion between risk assessment and real software assessment. It's just, um, so risk assessment is way cheaper, because there's nothing you have to do at the end of it. You just produce a report. Um, so how do, we, how, how do we know how good the tools are? Nobody publishes comparison studies. Um, and there are calibration test suites uh, from NIST and IARPA, Juliet and, and Stone Soup, and I'll talk about. Let me talk about those real quickly. Um, NSA produced, and now, and now NIST manages, a set of artificially constructed tests. They, 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 had, they started out um, with uh, uh, 230 different flaws, CWEs in the code, and had constructed, in, so, in, in, in somewhat of an ad hoc way, uh, are increasingly complex containers of code to contain these flaws. Um, and they generated a whole bunch of variations together. So they ended up with 65,000 small unit tests, each one labeled with the, with the flaw in the code and a false positive version of the flaw. And you can run your tools against that. And that's actually pretty good. It's out there for free um, on the NIST website. Um, IARPA recently came out with Stone Soup, which is 16 real eight Java 8 C++ programs. Here are some examples. Um, they, they took 78 CWEs and went in and mutated the code to contain some number of those. And they produced 8,500 complete test programs. These are complete real world programs containing a known flaw. So basically, you run your tool against the unmutated version, you run your tool against the mutated version, take the diff of the results, and did you find the diff should contain the flaw they inserted? It doesn't help you with false positives in the code because you don't know what's in the code that they didn't put in. What's in the code already, native to the code? What flaws are there? So, but it does see if you can find the things they put in the code in, a, in the context of a real complex control flow, data flow, large program base. So these are great. These are good. We, we have some thoughts on how to, make, how to make these better, but these are really great resources. And NIST maintains both of these, and they're free. So, okay. Um, okay. Now, let me talk about legal hazards. So in 2009, um, we did an interesting study. Uh, we had been doing in-depth software assessments um, of real systems. The Condor system was one of the first we did. We had a bunch of known exploitable. We built. We we only in our in our blue teaming methodology. We only consider something a reportable vulnerability if we can hand the 
an exploit to the software authors. We did a, some very in-depth asse uh, assessment of this million line code base, very sophisticated distributed system, multi-platform code. Um, and we had 15 well-documented vulnerabilities. We said, what's the best of the breed? Uh, our, our friends in industry, academia, and government said, use Fortify and Coverity. Uh, we then ran those tools against this reference set of, of code. And Fortify found six. Coverity found one of the 16 weaknesses. And we published that uh, along with analysis of the false positives. There are a lot of false positives. That's a big issue because these six and one are lost in a lot of noise there. Um, and five years later, Converity went legal on us. I said, what? You published that? You can't do that. Our license said that. I said, no. The license we had at the time said we could. Sorry. Um, but they changed their license now. Um, you can't do the study anymore because of licensing. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the, the shrink-wrapped EULA DeWitt clause license. So David DeWitt is, is one of our Professor Emeriti, um, very well-known database guy in 1983. He published a paper in VLDB comparing a bunch of systems, including Oracle. Larry Ellison went crazy, called our chair, and demanded that he would be fired. After he called the chair, he called our dean because our chair hung up on him. Um, hanging up on Larry Ellison is a great deal of emotional pleasure in doing that. Um, uh, Oracle then, and now others, changed their, all their license agreements to say you cannot report, benchmark, or compare the results. It's called the DeWitt Clause after David. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, this is a hazard. So here's an example. Um, I won't tell you whose these are. These are all. These are from now from software assessment tools, specifically tools like I've been talking about from commercial vendors. Um, you shall not publish or release third-party benchmarks or other comparisons. Okay. Um, uh, here's another one. Uh, should not be limited to the results of benchmarking the software or software documentation without blah, blah, without so and so's approval. Okay. Here's another one. Um, customer will not disclose any third parties comparison results to the operation of our software with other products. So this is what you're buying. Do it. So, you know, uh, consumer reports cannot operate in this space. Uh, not limited liability clauses are even worse. You know, the wheels fall off your car, it's your problem. Uh, no warranty clauses. No reverse engineering. My friend Lauren Kohnfelder pointed me at that recent uh, blog post by uh, oh, Oracle again, oh God, um, saying, you know, you know, if I want to figure out if my code's safe, I can't do a binary analysis of the code because that's reverse engineering. And I love binary analysis. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so we went and talked to the Senate Homeland Security Government Affairs and Government Affairs Committee uh, about two months ago and trying to get them motivated. We also have um, some intellectual property right lawyers who take on a public advocacy. They make bunches of money doing patent disputes. Many of you companies spend a lot of money on these fees. So these, but they're, they're really public minded. These guys are really, there's, they're really interested in privacy and security concerns. And so we're starting to make a movement to try to see if we can make some leverage about getting rid of these clauses. Because um, we think um, this is counter to our national and international security. OK. So, so the lack of transparency, the capabilities of these tools, I can't tell you which tools are good at which things because I'm not allowed to. I can't publish them. I can't do good academic studies. I think that's hurting global security. OK. Um, OK, let me take a few minutes, and I don't have enough time to go through these, but let me show you some weird things I found in code. And um, so just because I've been talking in about BS stuff, and let me talk about some code stuff, because that's more fun. OK. <clears throat> this is from one of the tutorials we teach. My colleague Alyssa Hyman and I teach these tutorials. And um, I, this is one of the things we do in our tutorials is we only show you stuff we found for real. We started teaching these tutorials because we're finding this stuff in our blue team and red team exercises. So this is, this is something we found. OK. Now, here's the scenario. And you guys are all parsing this, and I shouldn't have put up the code. Um, so here's the problem. You wrote, um, uh, you wrote, some, uh, um, you wrote some code in Perl. Um, and the problem is, everybody else wrote the, 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 the logging system for your, for your world 
was written in Python. There's a Python library. Everybody's logging to a standard system log. Logging is hugely important for security, for forensics reasons. Um, and so you need to use um, the Python uh, logging library. And you can either rewrite your Perl code in Python, or you can, you can write a second version of the logging library in Perl. Or you can do something much faster and easier, which is um, fire off the Python interpreter and read the log files from your Perl version and send them to the Python interpreter running that library. So you're basically, your, your Perl code is going to fire up the Python interpreter, generate Python code on the fly, and send it to it. And this was a good idea. This was really, this was a great idea. So, so if you know about Perl, you know, there's a whole language in the open command. This, this is basically popen, putting a pipe character in the open. You can create files in open, but you can also create processes. You can remove files, duplicate files. You can do all sorts of stuff in, in the open statement in, in, in Perl. So this fires off the Python interpreter. It reads in the logs and spits them out down here. And, um, Basically, if you, if you cause a bad event to happen and it logs it, we actually cause it to log some stuff that's got some valid Python code in it. So instead of saying log it with just a name, we call the log it function where we, imp where we allow it to import the OS interface. And then we call the system function, allows us to run a shell command. And we get to let you basically run any commands you want um, as a result of it logging information. OK. So that was kind of fun. OK. So, so this is the kind of stuff we're doing in the real world. Um, cleverness should definitely be punished. Um, dynamic code generation offers a hugely rich attack vehicle. And, and it worries me whenever I see that. And this is one that tools should have been able to find, but they don't seem to be able to find it. Um, I'm going to skip this one. That one's kind of fun. But I want to show you another one that's less obvious. And this one, I want to show you code. So here's a system where you're logged into the client code. You're going to access a service. And this, they also have a nightly analytics thing that goes over their log files looking for bad pattern. So you type something bizarre into your web form. You request the service to process that web form. The service says, bleh. And says, I don't like that, and logs it. OK, nothing bad happened. It rejected the bad input. So it turns out that this bad string is, en when the, is enough to exploit the log, nightly log processor and cause it to be owned. So we have a piece of software running as a root behind the firewall, isolated with no interface to the real world, and we own it through the string that we fed to the log process server so that went into there. And this, was, this is real stuff. These are, again, real things. OK. OK, so if a single program wasn't hard enough to analyze, flows through a series of programs harder. Um, in, at Los Alamos, when they're looking at nuclear simulations, which is a whole sequence of many, many programs generating output files, going into more physics files, more physics files, they actually track the provenance of data. So if they discover they want to change an input parameter or perhaps got an input parameter wrong, they know exactly what output data sets were affected by it. So they know which simulations to rerun because the simulations take weeks or months. So they're tracking taint effectively through a distributed system of programs. We need to be able to do that same thing on a larger scale if we want to be able. So it's not just enough to analyze code. We need to be able to do that. OK. Um, we need to be having system scales. Programs don't live in isolation. And um, I have a whole discussion of Heartbleed, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, we have a really good paper on that. And I'll, and I'll tell you. Um, uh, so I apologize for the fact that you, know, you guys were asking too many questions. So that's your fault. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, I'm, and I'm happy to share these slides. I'll tell you why Heartbleed failed and, and why tools don't get into that. But, so I had all sorts of, uh, I just want to say one thing. This is how they fixed Heartbleed. If 1 plus 2 plus payload plus 16, this is a, an absolutely correct check. But 
you know, if you hand in code to my undergraduate class with an embedded consonant, you lose half your points for that assignment. <laughs> So when the Heartbleed, when the open SSL guys with the entire world watching them were all freaking traumatized because we've lost security in so many places and everybody's watching you to do your best job, this is the code they wrote. And I called them up and said, what's with that? And he said, well, the original code was 19 plus payload. We thought this was much better. <laughs> OK. OK. So um, I, I, I'll, I'll be happy to walk through that. Um, um, we should stop being surprised about things like Heartbleed. Clearly, languages in the 70s are killing us. That's not new. Um, said so many lovely new languages. Um, and, and this is to say, what if we, in the meantime, how about tools that. What are the educators doing to teach these children new languages? Um, not enough. Not enough. We're too busy getting behind to get ahead. Though we are, we are, using, we are, we are using them in some courses, um, but not enough. Absolutely. What languages do you Depends on the context. That's, that's a big co question. You know, for, you know, it really depends on what you're, you're doing. I, I like Go and Swift, but that's, those aren't big data languages. They're really cool big data languages. I mean, it really depends on what you're doing. Uh, the problem is if we teach a funny language, we get shouted at by companies. Why aren't you teaching C Sharp? OK. OK. Um, OK, if memories were all I sang, I'd rather drive a truck. Thank you, Ricky Nelson. Um, if I left you out of any discussions here, I want to hear from you. And um, I'm running long, but I'll handle questions until they cut me off. And then please come and talk with me afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned early on the, the idea of getting, uh, getting students uh, interested or aware of, uh, of these sorts of issues very, uh, as early as possible. Is there much work since a lot of a lot of kids get started by, by programming games? Is there a lot is there, uh, you know tools and approaches specifically in the gaming area that would be valuable? I, I don't know any tools specifically in the gaming area, and it might actually it might actually be fun. I mean I don't know are there to develop some really uh, uh, engaging games that had a security aspect to them. Combine the gaming and the security aspect. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we as a community play games all the time. We do capture the flag. We do all these contests, things like that. It would be really interesting to see if we could, if we could develop. I'll ch there's a challenge out there. Is there, a, is there a gaming version we can engage the average programmer, the average kid out there in that would teach them this stuff? So, let me stop just a second. Let's thank the speaker first, and then I think we can stick around for some more questions. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>